as his first novel that is not a spy thriller starring CIA agent Blackford Oaks. Uh, the new book by a master storyteller is always an event, and I'm happy to welcome him back. William F. Buckley is here, Bill. Thank you, Robert. Why did you decide not to write about Blackford Oaks? Well, the Cold War was ended, thanks to the likes of you. <laughs> so I, I feel we ought to celebrate it by <laughs> That's true. focusing on other matters. Other matters, huh? I have not read it yet, but I did get a synopsis, and uh, in, in looking at it, it the, the thing is, it talks about two men uh, who were in World War II, and, and one uh, uh, committed an act of cowardice, or turned out to be coward. Yeah, that was, that was sort of their first major <clears throat> encounter, and it, it rather fascinated me. Uh, here was a situation in which uh, these two soldiers fighting their first battle are told at a particular second to join in a general charge. They're given a particular uh, Nazi machine gun to overcome, and you hear their conversation as it, as it counts down, and all of a sudden, the moment comes, and they say, come on, we're, we're off. And he has a, he has a he seizure of cowardice here. Yeah. So the other guy consummates a mission, and then you think, gee, I better go back and get this guy, haul him up here, it's dark. And then people won't know that he Covered up for his friend. That he was yeah, yeah. So, so, but he's so mortified, the coward, that he tries to kill himself. Well, he he doesn't die, but the the streak of mischief in Danny, the other guy, is such that he puts him up for Silver Star, for bravery right. in action, and of course he can't deny the story because that would get him into trouble. So this is the beginning of a relationship that lasts uh, twenty years. It's an intense relationship. They become roommates at college. And Danny marries the brother of Henry's other. And you see the progression in the character of these two men. The one trying to atone for the act of cowardice at this critical moment in history, and the other yielding to temptation after temptation after temptation until he becomes um, a not very nice guy. Let me ask you, that, that, that universal moment, uh, men uh, who have not faced combat, uh, all men wonder how they will react. And that is a constant theme in in uh, men's lives, I yeah. think. How, yeah. how are they going to react if their family is attacked, if they are attacked, if they're in a combat situation, if they are suddenly called upon to be brave? It was and the obsession of Hemingway. That's right, it was the obsession of Hemingway. Uh, have you thought about that in your own life? I mean, how, how, how uh, do you handle coward, cowardice and bravery? And do all men, most men rise to the occasion, some don't? Well, I, I was in the infantry and um, if the war hadn't concluded when it did, I, I would have been in Japan. So, uh, you know, inevitably, one thinks a little bit about that, but my, my feeling was that the conventional, uh, the conventional impetus will, will, uh, will, will, will guide you. So the answer is no, I, I, did, I wasn't afraid of it, which is by no means to say that I, I don't experience a fear. But uh, it's pretty rare, as you, as you point out, it's pretty rare. Yeah, it's, it, you know, the act of cowardice is, I've, I've seen it or in other walks of life, and it's, yeah. a, it's a rare occasion. But my point is that will men create wars to continue to test this need in their fundamental character? Because we're not in hand-to-hand -hand combat anymore. There are very few instances of real infantry behavior. But how will men deal with this question in their lives well, in the future? A, a, as you know, there is the thesis that uh, societies go to war in part because they are cathartic experiences. And the societies that go a long spell without that kind of a test, so to speak, of their manhood uh, are societies that uh, seek other forms of, of expressing their, uh, their masculinity uh, and, and uh, I'm not entirely sure this is wrong. There's a, certain, uh, there's a certain something that braces a society by that total experience which can't be replicated in any other means. That's but why even, uh, people who've been in the combat situation, that's their whole life. They can never top that experience. Yeah, it's, it's pretty hard to top. Uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, it, is, it is a singular experience. I, my roommate at college, uh, the guy next to him was torn to pieces in Iwo Jima. Now, he didn't dwell on it. But uh, it, was, it was a memorable, unforgettable experience. I've got to take a break. We're here uh, talking with William F. Buckley. The new book is Brothers No More. It's a novel by Bill Buckley. We'll be right back. We're going to talk a little politics in a minute, a couple other things, too. Stay with us.
We're back talking with William F. Buckley, whose new book, Brothers No More, is out right now. It's a novel. There it is on your screen. Uh, are you doing anything writing besides just your column now on politics? And, and you seem to be more of a novelist these days than almost anything else. Are you enjoying that? Uh, well, right now I'm working um, on a book on, on Christianity. Yeah. But um, it, it's hard for me to, uh, to concentrate on it until I get back to Switzerland. That's where I do my book writing. Uh. There are too many other things to do, like you. <laughs> you have to do television. <laughs> All right, let's switch for a second to what's going on politically. Colin Powell... Uh, Everybody says he's either a very liberal Republican or a kind of moderate Democrat or the kind of Democrat that Bill Clinton said he was going to be. Um, what's your take on Colin Powell? Let me just throw some names at you and you kind of give me a, st a state of where they are and what, what's going to happen with them. Okay, Colin Powell. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, a week ago I read a column by Bill Safai on Colin Powell reacting to something he had said. In, in the New Yorker magazine, and uh, I thought, gee, Colin Powell is no longer a virgin. Uh, and <laughs> he had to Ford, take a position. Ford Benning was nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he, uh, he has a lot of that uh, ahead of him, if, in fact, he delineates a, a program. One has a feeling about General Powell that he would like to sort of transcend uh, uh, programs. Now, I, I think he's a man of character. He's a very attractive guy, as you know. So I, I do think that he has these feelings, but throughout uh, his public life, that as far as I can judge, he has sort of transcended it by a very choice, by, by a, a very choice use of words. For instance, he's in favor of affirmative action and against quotas. Now that's a, that's a sort of a circle squaring. Uh, 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 there are those who believe affirmative action means quotas. I mean, it, 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 well, well, that's what it, what it has come to mean. If right. affirmative action simply means helping out people who need help, then everybody would be for it. Right. But uh, to the extent that you help somebody out at the expense of somebody else, you run into the business of equal treatment under the law. And the Fourteenth Amendment was not designed as an anti white anti male instrument. The, so, so he has these problems. Uh, the uh, the press is currently writing that if the Republicans' party does not embrace Colin Powell, that proves the Republican Party is racist. Uh, that's the theme that I'm reading in the press. How do you react to that? Well, I, I think it's um, it, it's preposterous. I I, uh, I think it's much more interesting that uh, Powell is more in, is is he's more if, comfortable if, with the Republicans than Democrats. Uh, point one. Point two. Uh, as of right now, more. Whites, by percentage, are formed than blacks. That's true. If, if, he, if he would run tomorrow, the estimate is that not more than 40, 45 percent of blacks would vote for him as of this minute mm -hmm. because they associate him with the other party. So I, I think that the race issue is, is, just, is just intruded in a situation in which it simply doesn't belong. If Colin Powell ran as a Republican and uh, became the nominee, could he bring African Americans back to the Republican Party where they were under Lincoln? or? I mean, would it be a fundamental realignment of the African-American vote? Well, uh, Charlie Rangel said to me a couple of years ago, we were relaxing between an engagement. He said, you know something, Bill? He said, if, if, uh, if George Bush had named Colin Powell for vice president in 1988, you could have kissed the Democratic Party goodbye. But I think catching though that was, and persuasive that was, I don't think that would be true anymore. Uh, and that's a good sign, i.e. to have a... I wrote a piece for Look Magazine in 1976 in which I said, I hope we will have a black president by 1980. Now that, that was considered at that point kind of a, a slightly crazy idea, i.e. Uh, uh, inconceivable. It is no longer inconceivable. Oh, no. And, and the, fact that it's con the, fact that it's, yeah, the fact that it's inconceivable is a very good sign. Yeah. Uh, Bob Dole seemed like the runaway winner. Does he still, or is he? Uh, you should see any cracks in that uh, armor. Well, uh, to the extent that people feel that he is ideologically opportunistic, that is a, a crack. But uh, Bob Dole is a terribly able guy. He's he's run a very long uh, course, and there is a certain instinct in favor of professionalism. They had a Jimmy Carter who was not thought of as, as a real professional. Right. And you know more about this than anybody, having worked with Nixon as you, as you, as you did. Uh, but the, uh, for, for that reason, I think that Dole 
can't be counted uh, uh, out. Uh, the, the, only, the, the only thing that would do him in is any signs of, um, of age. Right. If he hits his foot going up the stairs, the press will turn it into a three-week uh, Bob Dole's too old. That's, that's what I keep waiting for. They keep hinting and wanting and hoping he catches a cold. That's but right. uh, so far they haven't, they haven't been able to pull that off. We're back in just a second. We've got one more segment with Bill Buckley. Stay with us. The book is Brothers No More. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> We're talking about last night's 60 Minutes. Uh, Phil Graham, is he alive or dead as a candidate? Oh, no, I, I think he's alive. Uh, 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 Graham is a terribly bright guy, and nobody Very doubts, tenacious, most tenacious yeah, man in that race. That's right, and, and, and nobody doubts uh, the integrity of his, of his convictions. Right. Uh, he, there's, there's something about him that uh, doesn't work, however, uh, Iowa seemed to show that uh, there's, there's a lot of life there. Uh, I have a great respect for Phil Graham. Yeah, I, I've known Phil a long time. He's been a guest on the show. And, in fact, he was a former client of mine, so I know how tenacious he really is. Yeah. Uh, I did his race back in the days when he ran from, uh, he quit the Democrat Party and the Democratic Party and moved over to the Republican Party. Uh, Pat Buchanan seems to be doing a little better this year than expected. Uh, how do you read that? Well, I, I'm, I'm an old friend of Pat's, as I'm right. sure you are, but right. I'm terribly disappointed in the... the uh, Emphasis he's putting on 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 tariffs. I find that a, a phony economic issue uh, It doesn't belong in the portfolio of, of a conservative and uh, He he is I think using uh, that um, uh, Opportunistically I said to Phil Graham look don't you have to at some point deal with this issue with Pat Buchanan he said uh, Like he said, I'm, I'm, I've been a professor of economics. I know how to handle that problem, but you can't handle the doctrine of comparative advantage in a soundbite, mm -hmm. and, and I think that, that that's correct. That's right. So, so that, that part of him, it, it also, also Pat's uh, isolationism uh, becomes, I think, progressively unrealistic. It simply isn't true that we don't have a stake at all in Europe and what happens there and in Japan, what happens there. It's not true. Yeah. My problem is where he's going to find enough chain link fence to put across the Mexican border. I mean. I'm not sure the Americans want to see a Berlin Wall or a Mexican Wall or a fence. I, don't, I, I just have a feeling that people would rebel against that. I don't know. Well, they, they certainly wouldn't like uh, any visual representation of a, of a Berlin Wall. However, I'm told that there are only four or five choke points where the traffic seems to have to come through. Uh, and Desperate that people find wall. ways of uh, avoiding and creating new new ways of getting across. So uh, people who come to this country presumably are desperate or they wouldn't come here. And I think that there's a piece of that that, that uh, Americans uh, feel believe in. Well, that, that's an interesting position, but I don't think it's, it's quite to be measured as in the case of refugees from the Soviet Union. Uh, you, you, if, to the extent that there are impediments, there is probably a reflection of those impediments in the number of people who, who brave the uh, experience. So, so, so I, I'm not, put it this way, I don't think one ought to give up. And in fact, in the San Diego area, they have reduced uh, illegal entries by something like 50 or 60 percent, mm -hmm. by simply a little bit more diligence. Pete Wilson make a mistake by skipping Iowa? You, you ask me questions for which I have no absolutely unequipped to answer. Oh, come on. You know. I, I, well, let me answer that then. I'll answer okay. it. You ask Good. me. Good. Did he make a mistake? Did he? No, probably not because he couldn't afford it to be there and he would have come in fourth or fifth and he, he might as well take the hit there and move on. George Bush came in, uh, what, behind Pat Robertson, uh, third or fourth in uh, Iowa, and uh, still pulled it out in New Hampshire. So he's trying to look at that model, and he thinks he can do the same thing. So can I quote I you when I write on the subject? Absolutely. Uh, you quote me on it. <laughs> uh, let me go back to your novel for one second. When you, 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 I saw you about six months ago, and you just finished the Blackford Oaks uh, sort of, what do reader. you call that, the compendium? Reader, the, the, yeah. the, the reader, where you, you told all the things. How long does it take you to write a novel? Uh, well, I, I write, uh, I try to write 1,500 words a day when I, when I write my books, which means uh, six weeks. Wow. Well, That's fast, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, it's faster than some. It's a lot slower than big. Trollope wrote uh, 3,000 words every morning. Uh, er, er, Earl Stanley Gardner would stand up and start dictating his book and wouldn't sit down until he had finished it. Ooh. 
Brothers No More. Listen, when we were getting ready to do the show, he went over to the piano. Please go over there and play what you were playing. Nice to see you. Go play us <laughs> off the air. Okay? Pull a bench out oh, yeah. and sit there and play. We'll, we'll, this is uh, Bill Buckley. This is why he can't write more than 1,500 words a day because he's playing the piano. Very good for a good. Listen, uh, you're going to be 70 years old. Uh, pretty soon, yeah. Is that a big deal? Your no. friends are throwing parties like it is a big deal. Do you feel 70? Um, I don't know what it, it is to experience uh, being 70. If you woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I said, How old are you? Based on how you feel, what would you answer? 100. <laughs> Uh, you find I convince you. Feel, you, you feel 100, <laughs> huh? Do you really? No, no. I, I'm, I'm. Do you work out? Yes. You do? Mm -hmm. Treadmill or what do you do? Treadmill. Yeah? Because you're in great shape. Well, it's nice to say that. Uh, the uh, a Treadmill three times a week um, is supposed to take care of your heart problems. Right. But not of obesity. You should That's do true. It, uh, you can't. You, the... you got to do it uh, six times a week as I do. That's why I'm look like this. Here's the book, Brothers No More, Bill Buckley. Roger, Thank you. nice to see you. Okay, thanks yeah. to Boy George as well. And thanks to you for watching, everyone. See you next time on Straightforward.